on the event. Um, I just want to give a few reminders. So since this virtual this is a virtual shadowing session, you will need to fill out the Google form that I sent out in the chat box to get a certificate for attending this event. So if you're a PMSA member and you want to get points for this, you would have to fill out the membership point form as well, in addition to the virtual shadowing point form. And then the membership point form asks for a random code word, and I'll send that in the chat box towards the end of the session. So make sure to look out for that. And if the chat box gets filled with answers from the interactive questions we'll be doing, remember you can access these Google Forms on our website at pmsa.me. And if you have any questions over this information that I went over, it can be directed to me through the chat feature, or you can email outreach at pmsa.me. With that said, um, Dr. Rao, you can take it away. Okay. Okay, is that being shared? Yep. Okay, so I'll start up then. So hi guys, uh, I hope everyone is uh, having a great day and uh, I hope uh, all of you are excited to learn about group India. I'm sorry to interrupt. A little bit about uh, my. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I think Matt is lagging a little bit. Yeah, and our medical. Uh, US. Sorry? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but can you start over again? Um, your audio was cutting out for me. I'm not sure if that's my issue, but. Yeah, now, now I think it's good because your video was also stuck. Um, I think you're on mute. Okay. Are you able to hear me now? Yep, yep. Why Sorry is this for that. Sound? Okay. It's the first time it's happening this way. No, is that okay? Yeah, no, that's fine. That's so much better. Yeah, you were just lagging the audio, so I just wanted to make sure everyone can hear. Okay. So I'm just starting from here once again. I, I'll just start up with my training session because uh, uh, in India, it's a bit different from uh, US. So uh, in India, we just get into med school after giving our national entrance examination. And I did my med school at uh, PES Institute of Medical Sciences and Research Center in Andhra Pradesh, which is for four and a half years. And then I passed out in distinction and was awarded the gold medal by the then uh, chief minister of our state. He is like uh, almost the governor of your states. And later I completed my one year compulsory rotational internship from Narayana Medical College, where we'll be posted in different medical and surgical branches. And then I cleared once again, my national entrance examination for post-graduation and I opted for otorhinolaryngology in Pratima Institute of Medical Sciences. Then once again, I cleared my exit exam after three years course where I stood as a university topper in my state. Then I did my senior residency in ENT and hidden neck uh, surgery for about an year at government court ENT hospital, which is a state run tertiary center. Uh, ENT center at Hyderabad. Then once again, I did my fellowship and cochlear implant surgery for about six months at PD Hinduja Hospital, Mumbai. And currently I have my private practice. As I told you earlier, I'm one of the director and a consultant ENT, head and neck surgeon at Rao's ENT group of hospitals. I practice luckily with my husband and my father-in-law who are also ENT surgeons. 
So a brief outline uh, about today's presentation. In my presentation today, we'll uh, go through an introduction to the otorhinolaryngology. What does it mean? And I'll make you walk through along with me about how to diagnose and also manage a few cases in ENT, including a few uh, short surgical clips. And in between each uh, case reviews, I'll be popping up certain uh, endoscopic pictures and uh, you'll be taking a guess at the probable uh, diagnosis. I'll try to keep the discussion as uh, interactive as uh, possible with you. So with that being said, otorhinolaryngology is a surgical subspeciality in medicine which deals with both surgical and the medical management of ear, nose, throat, and the structures which are related to head and neck. So we, I, an otorhinolaryngologist deals with everything in the head and neck except the brain and the eyes. Um, with this brief introduction, let me just crack up into the case presentations. Um, coming to the case one, a 25-year-old female presented to us with the uh, complaints of left ear pain. So on taking a detailed history, the left ear pain started since three days. It was sudden in onset and it was progressively worsening day by day. Her ear pain aggravated on chewing, drinking water, talking, and even opening the mouth also. And the pain relieved temporarily on taking some pain meds. So what else would you like to ask in the history in, uh, with regards to the complaint? So I would just check in the chat box. You can just answer it. Anything else you would like to ask in the history for the patient? I think it is lagging. Yeah, someone answered it. Has she felt pain this before? Yes, that's an excellent question. Yes, that needs to be checked for whether she had some similar episodes in the past or this is the first time she's facing this. And anything else you would, you would like to add on? Because it's something related with the ear pain. Yes. Has she been exposed to any loud sounds recently? Yes. Even that's a good question. Because even exposure, sudden exposure to loud sounds uh, also causes ear pain. Excellent, excellent. I didn't mention that in my history actually, but I should. Maybe ask about her hearing, any other symptoms including headaches, yeah. Good. Yes, this is one more uh, good question what the other person has asked. Has the patient had any injuries in that area in the past or is there any hearing impairment? Yes, we need to ask about the history of trauma. So in this way, we just proceed. So we ask as someone of you just asked me, they, uh, we need to check whether there is any history of recent episodes or she had these episodes in for the first time or whether she had any history of uh, cold recently or whether any history of trauma or any ear discharge and we also inquire about the fever because we need to check whether it's associated with some infection or not and giddiness to rule out any inner ear malformations also so i would suggest taking a detailed history is really important because in order to arrive at a probable diagnosis before proceeding for normal examination and investigations, because most of the times, half of the diagnosis would be understood from the proper history itself. And once again, coming back to the patient, uh, she did not give any history of uh, uh, recent episodes, similar episodes in the past. And there is no significant past medical and surgical history also. So then I proceeded with uh, routine ENT examination. So this is me in my OPD room and the one who is sitting just opposite to me, it's, she's, she's not a true patient. 
she just volunteered for being a practice patient and even i usually do not wear this amount of protective gear on me it's just uh, taken a few days back and i'm looking very odd in that i know and i place this video in order to make sure that you feel you're truly shadowing an ent surgeon and hope this uh, helps so this is how we do an a routine ent examination i put on the headlight and then i start examining ears because she came with an ear pain so examination of uh, uh the ear pinna and the surrounding area they appeared perfectly normal and on the nose examination we do and we call it as anterior rhinoscopy on nasal examination we i found out that the patient had some nasal discharge specifically on one side and on pressing the cheeks the patient experienced some sinus tenderness and the oral cavity and the oropharynx they appeared perfectly normal and on head and neck examination they also include as a part of examination of ent so they were absolutely normal and there were no palpable lymph nodes for more in depth examination we shift to the endoscopy unit here i am performing a, a an auto endoscopy also called ear endoscopy we examine the external auditory canal and also the ear drum and this is the auto endoscopic video of uh, the right side canal and that's a right ear drum and by the way this is how a normal looking ear drum looks like and in the left ear there is a bit of cerumen at the entrance but what do you think has happened to her ear drum on the left side there is a gross difference between the both the ear drums any explanation or you want to comment on this how does the ear drum looks like yes someone answered it's an infection inflammation yes true true red and inflamed yes obviously it's an infection and if you just observe there is a leash of blood vessels over there entirely and there is also a uh, pus and her ear drum it entirely looks bulged than the normal as if the pus is under tension so this is definitely inflamed and it is infected also so then we uh, go ahead with the nose examination we check the nose through nasal endoscopy and we call this as diagnostic nasal endoscopy and here i'm passing the endoscope through the right nas nostril now we can see the septum which separates the right and the left nostril and the flesh which is seen is the turbinate and we need to make sure that we do not cause any injury to the surrounding structures while performing this procedure of course we give uh, some amount of numbing spray and also decongestant spray which makes the patient more comfortable uh, during the entire procedure and uh, you know this is the the nasopharyngeal area is the area right now where they are taking the covid swabs right now because you know this is the covid era then we pass the endoscope through the left nostril now you you can see very clearly the pus getting collected at the nasopharynx and you can see even the eustachian tube uh, moving <clears throat> so why do you think we need to examine uh, the nose and also the throat of a patient who comes with ear pain So there is someone who mentioned in the chat if there wasn't anything seen in the ear scopy would you still have scored the nose yes yes that's the explanation what i'm going to give you now even though there is nothing seen then that becomes even more dangerous if is if there is something there uh it becomes very obvious if there is nothing but in spite of which the patient complains of pain in the ear when there is nothing abnormally looking that's when we need to proceed with further investigations but right now there is clear cut inflammation only on one side of the ear 
And once again, on nasal endoscopy, which is a routine procedure we do, it was very obvious that her left side nasal cavity, I'll just show you here. So this is the uh, right side uh, nasopharynx area, which is uh, pointed and the pointed yellow one is uh, the eustachian tubal opening. And on the left side, you can clearly see that it is filled with pus. Okay, so you can see that all these structures are interconnected. And these eustachian tubes, which lie at the back of the nose, they connect to the middle ear. So the infection from the nose, it spreads to the middle ear very easily. And hence, because of the infection from the nose, there is infection in the ear called middle ear infection. Similarly, Sometimes even the tonsils get swollen up and they complain of ear pain in, when they have some tonsillitis. So because of the common nerve supply, which both the tonsils and ear, ha ear have, so it's because of the Jacobson's nerve. And this is called rhifferotalgia. So we need to check the throat and the oral cavity also. Sometimes even I have just operated today for a malignancy in the tongue where the patient just presented to me with ear pain. And when I did an endoscopy, I found out that he has a huge cancer carcinoma at the base of the tongue. And the patient just landed up with ear pain. So it's really, really very important to check ear, nose, throat, and also head and neck of a patient, uh, uh, whoever comes with uh, ear pain. It's not something which can be just left that way. All right. So what do you think is the diagnosis? So it's very obvious. The diagnosis is uh, acute otitis media. Otitis is ear, media is middle ear. So it's an acute infection or, uh, or the inflammation of the middle ear. And how do we manage this uh, condition? So we manage this uh, medically with oral antibiotics, some oral and nasal decongestants, some mucolytics, and of course, some symptomatic pain medications. And we usually review the patient after 10 days by the time when she must have completely recovered. All right, a question for you all now. So what do you think this is? Everyone has to answer. I'll, I'll just give you some breathing space and I want most of you to answer this. Do you want me to repeat this? So it's very obvious, right? I'm just repeating it. Okay, here you can see a pulsatile uh, this charge, which is popping out from the hole in the eardrum, like a beating heart. If the previous condition called acute otitis media, the almost previous condition, is not treated with oral meds and oral antibiotics, the eardrum ruptures and it pours out this charge as seen or as shown in the video. So just never neglect the ear pain. So moving on to differential diagnosis. Differential diagnosis is something which present with more or less the same conditions. So it's like the other probable diagnosis, uh, like pain in the ear. I'll show you how a normal ear rum looks like so that you can just uh, compare. So I'm just popping out the endoscopic pictures. So I want you to at least take a guess of the probable diagnosis. All right. So what do you think this condition is? I'll, I'll give you some choices. It's quite easy. There is some hyphae. Wow, wow, most of you are answering, excellent. Okay, 
most of you have given the right answer. It is otomycosis. Oto stands for ear and mycosis is fungus. So it's the fungal infection in the ear. So you can very clearly see the spores and the hyphae, which is a very characteristic feature of the fungus. The patient, patients usually present with severe pain and itching. And sometimes they also present with curdy white precipitate if it is exactly because of candida, but here it's a mixture of candida albicans and also of the aspergillus niger. So it's a mixed fungal infection. So we treat with this with oral uh, uh, antifungals and also some topical antifungal medication. And we also ask them to keep the ear dry. So coming up next, what do you think this is? This is a pretty straightforward thing. So I'm not giving you options. You can just answer it. You can see a hole in the urine. Yes, someone answered this. Yes, most of you are answering. But most of you are answering that there is some hemorrhage or there is some bleeding in the ear. But I've actually kept the normal looking eardrum also over there for you to compare. So that's a normal eardrum, how it looks like. Oh, I think my arrow, yeah, looks like. But here you can see a clear cut perforation and a fresh bleed. So this is this picture usually appears after a slap injury. Uh, usually most of the patients do hide this from us. And this we call it as a traumatic uh, perforation. They land up with blood staining in the ear canal, severe pain in the ear, and also some uh, ringing sounds, sometimes even some hearing loss also. Okay, so what about this? So you can just compare with the previous thing. It's almost the same. It's bleeding. It's because of the canal injury or canal injury, which is followed by an RTA. So this is trauma to the external artery canal. And it also causes severe pain in the ear and also bleeding from the ear. All right. I am proceeding to the next uh, picture. What do you think this is? I'll give you options for this. This is really important. So this is the endoscopy picture when I just kept it in the kennel, the entire kennel. Yes, yes. Yes, perfect. This is called swimmer's ear. You can see both the walls of the external artery canal are collapsed. It's because of severe otitis extra, severe infection in the canal, external artery canal. This is very much common in the swimmers, especially in the kids because of repeated ear infections. And this is called swimmer's ear. All right, proceeding to the next one. What do you think this is? This is a bit complicated one. Here you can see the entire eardrum and almost all the bones in the ear have been eroded. And even the partition wall which separates from the ear to the brain is also being eroded. And this condition is cholesteatoma, which we call it as unsafe thing. Uh, this condition may also land up with uh, cranial nerve palsy, like facial nerve palsy, and also giddiness, etc. So one should be very careful and first look forward for this unsafe presentation when a patient comes with uh, ear pain. All right, proceeding to the next one. What do you think this is? And this is also pretty important for all the healthcare individuals. The most common things. I'll give you options for these. So here's a, there's a bit confusion between A and B. Most of you are giving options as A and B. 
it may be boil or it may be stored in the air. Of course, the endoscopy pictures look so, but actually the answer is uh, furangal or the hair follicle infection. You can very clearly see all the hairs and in between the hairs, there's some growth which is being popped up and the eardrum looks more or, more or less okay. This is usually called by, uh, caused by uh, staph aureus, staphylococcal aureus. And this we call it as boil or furuncle or follicular infection. And you know, this little tiny one, it causes excruciating ear pain. And people who use earbuds or people who have dandruff or psoriasis usually tend to get this boils or furuncles very common, very uh, frequently. And this keeps repeating. For example, if one gets furangal in one year, that there is a tendency where they keep touching this and once again touch with the same finger on the other side. And once again, the furangal starts appearing on the other side also. So it, the chances of contamination are very high with this furangal. And also it's, uh, it also causes excruciating ear pain. So even this should be checked when a patient comes with ear pain. So, with that, we'll close about the ear pain now. We're going to proceed with the case two. Oh, there is a question here. What would cancer of the ear canal look like when compared to this? Yes, we usually call this cholesteatoma as some something like cancer of the ear itself because it has a tendency to erode or eat away the bones. And it's a silent uh, thing which it's like diabetics you know you do not understand what's happening inside and finally patients present with excruciating ear pain they land up with almost all the complications so uh, this can be compared with the cancer but today I didn't place any picture of the carcinoma or cancer of the ear but maybe next time I would uh, definitely post it okay with that coming to the case two a 27-year-old male patient presented to us with complaints of ear discharge, right ear discharge. And on once again, taking a very clear history, the patient had right ear discharge, which for on and off since several years, and it was insidious in onset, and it is progressively worsening. And the ear discharge aggravated when the patient had common cold or any kind of upper respiratory tract infections. And the ear discharge relieved temporarily on taking some uh, ear drops. This ear discharge was also associated with hearing loss. And even this hearing loss was progressively worsening day by day. And the patient had no history of ear pain or trauma or fever, giddiness, and no significant past medical or surgical history. And on examination of the ear, the external ear, ear pinna and the surrounding area were absolutely normal. Nose examination was normal and there was no sinus tenderness and oral cavity, oropharynx, everything was normal. And even the hedonic examination was uh, normal. There were no palpable lymph nodes. On autoendoscopy, there was a mucopurulent discharge and on the right ear. And on suction clearance, the picture was like this and the left up left ear it appeared normal that's the normal looking eardrum on the left side and the nose and throat examination on endoscopy were normal so you can very clearly see that there is a perforation in the eardrum and here in this case scenario i would like to proceed with further investigations that is what i'm going to show you now all right, how do we proceed next? Because the patient has ear discharge and also hearing loss. So because the patient has hearing loss, we are proceeding with some clinical tests of hearing. Once we complete this uh, visual examination, we perform functional examination. That is uh, uh, clinical tests of hearing. And the main aim of this test is to mainly differentiate whether the patient has some amount of conductive component hearing loss or it's the age-related hearing loss like sensory neural hearing loss. And um, this is usually done with the help of a tuning fork. So uh, 
in Rennie's test, these are the how the functional examination of the ear goes on. We first inform the patient about the test that we are going to perform. Then we place a vibrating tuning fork first in front of their ear and then place in the back of their ear on the mastoid bone. They are advised to tell us which one sounded better, the front or the back. If the patient tells us that she's able to hear the front one better than the back that is on the bone, then this is called Reni positive. It implies that the air conduction of the patient is better than the bone conduction, which is kept on the mastoid bone. And if the patient tells us that she's able to hear the back one, which is on the mastoid bone better than the front one, this is called Reni negative. It implies that the air conduction is decreased and the patient is having some amount of conductive loss. And we perform this test in both the ears. And in our patient, the right ear was Reni negative, indicating that the patient has some amount of conductive component hearing loss on the right side. Then in the Weber's test, we place a tuning fork on the middle of the forehead and they should be able to tell us which side they're able to hear the better, whether on the right or on the left. Normally, they should be able to hear equally on both the ears or sometimes they may complain, they may tell us that they're able to hear it in the center itself. We call this as Weber centralized. But in case of conductive hearing loss, it is lateralized to the worse hearing ear. And in case of age-related hearing loss called the sensory neural hearing loss, it is lateralized to the better hearing ear. And in our case scenario, it is, lateral, it is lateralized to the right ear. So that's towards the affected ear. And she has clear conductive hearing loss on the right side. After the functional clinical examination, we send the patient for audiological, routine audiological evaluation and radiological evaluation. And this audiological evaluation is done by a trained and certified audiologist. And this one, once again, I placed it here so that you can see how a routine audiological examination will be done. This is called Pureton audiometry, which is the gold standard testing for uh, hearing evaluation. And this is mainly done in order to check the type and also the degree of hearing loss. In pure tone audiometry, these pure tones are presented to each ear individually at different frequencies and air and bone conductions are separated and the patient is asked to lift their hand as shown, whether they are able to hear the sounds or not. And these sounds are plotted on a graph. And what do you think this test is? This is impedance audiometry. Once again, this is a very gold standard testing, especially for the kids. This is an objective test. And uh, so it can be even done on the kids, irrespective of them raising their hands. This test mainly helps us to find the compliance or the stiffness of the tympanic membrane and also the ossicular system complex and thus assist the status of the middle ear. Here you can see that the patient has some amount of uh, conductive hearing loss on PTA and on the impedance, it shows a B type, a flat indicating of perforated ear, uh, eardrum and I'm not going in detail into this because this is just a orientation class so I'm just moving forward. And on radiological evaluation which includes a uh, high resonance computed tomography of the temporal bone, this is usually done in order to assess the ossicular chain, the bones, how are they functioning? How are they, is there any erosion? Uh, so the ossicles are the bones or the tiny bones which are present in the ear, whether they are intact or not. And the status of the mastoid bone also, whether there is any inflammation in the mastoid bone or is there or not. So, Finally, we actually know the diagnosis, but I actually dragged it in order to make sure that you see what is a pure tone audiometry, what is an impedance audiometry, how is it done. All right, so the finally the diagnosis is chronic suppurative otitis media with a perforation or hole in the eardrum. 
and also some mastoiditis with some amount of hearing loss, conductive hearing loss. And we manage this patient by doing a surgical procedure called cortical mastoidectomy, where we drill away the bone, diseased bone, and then ossiculoplasty, where we reconstruct the damaged ossicles or the hearing bones. And finally, an ear drum repair called the tympanoplasty. All right, this is me in my OR performing surgery on our patient. And this surgery is performed under local anesthesia with the patient lying down under microscopic vision. Um, in local anesthesia, only the part which is being operated will be numbed with injections. After local anesthesia, I give an incision post orally as shown behind the ear. Then with the help of the pottery, I elevate the flaps. Then I harvest the fascia, which is used for closing the ear rump hole. This is called the temporalis fascia. Then the deceased mastoid bone, that is a drill, which I'm holding with my right hand. The entire deceased mastoid bone is uh, being drilled off as shown. And in my left hand, we hold a suction cannula. Now you are able to visualize the hole in the eardrum very clearly. Then um, that's the graft which is dried up and which is harvested earlier. It is taken and it is tucked under the perforation. I kept the video on the fast mode so that just to speeden it up. So we tuck it under the perforation and this is the final picture. You can see that the entire perforation is being closed. Finally apply some sutures. That's how we do the procedure. So what are the other probable diagnoses which present with more or less similar complaints with some ear discharge and hearing loss? Okay. So in the second picture, you can see the ear drum perforation is a bit larger than the previous one, than the first one. And also the ossicle or the bone which is responsible for hearing is being exposed. So the hearing loss will be more when compared to the first one. This is called subtotal perforation or near, to no, near total perforation. And in the third picture, we can see an intact eardrum. Any guesses of what this could be? Because this is a bit tough one, but I hope one of you may answer this. The eardrum is intact, but there are some reddish dots over that. I'm not. Yeah, some of you are answering as Yeah, it's infection itself, but we usually call this as granulations. It's a combination of both middle ear infection and also only the eardrum infection. So we call this as meningitis of the ear canal, not even the ear canal, the eardrum infections. These kind of patients, they have ear discharge. We call this as weeping ear, but they do not require a surgical procedure. These granulations under microscopic examination and thorough cleaning and thorough providing of antibiotic drops, removing the granulations, the patient will be able to hear better and also uh, the ear, all, ear drum also becomes dry. So you can give a dry normal ear for this patients. This condition is known as granular meningitis. I think I'm running out of time. Okay. So I'll move on to the next uh, case scenario. So, well, this is an interesting case presentation. One of my patients uh, came to me complaining that she was hearing a mosquito flying around in her ear and wanted me to remove it. And in our history, she says that 
it started a few days back it was insidious onset it was also associated with some ear block and she also gave me a history stating that she had such similar uh, complaints in the past also and but there is no history of uh, uh, ear pain or trauma or fever giddiness she denies having them and she's not having any significant past medical and surgical history then on endoscopic examination this is how it appeared i kept the video on loop mode so that you guys can appreciate it what's happening you can see the air bubbles moving you can see the fluid and also the air bubbles which are moving within it perhaps was the patient confused that there was some mosquito which is uh, moving inside her ear and it's really very common for adults to complain of uh, ringing sounds or mosquito flying sounds in the ear uh, whenever they have this fluid in the middle ear and it really took some convincing on my part uh, to make the patient understand yes some of you answered this there is clear cut fluid behind the ear drum that's not an infection that's clear fluid behind the ear drum and on um, nasal endoscopic examination there were uh, polyps which were being visualized in both the nasal cavities so those are the polyps which are seen so those are the polyps which are very clearly seen that's not the normal flesh which we see in the nasal cavity it uh, which is suggestive of probably allergic uh, etiology and once again we proceed with the audiological evaluation on pta it revealed bilateral uh, hearing loss conductive and on the impedance audiometry bilateral b type flat audiograms were noted and uh, the diagnosis diagnosis is a very straightforward thing most of you have answered it's the fluid behind the ear drum someone asked me did she have what i go yeah it's that that's a really nice question some people when they present with isolated glue ear only one side glue ear they also land up with what i go uh and there is a condition called many ears or endolymphatic high drops where there is some fluid collection within the inner ear so there are some episodes or attacks of giddiness with fluid so that is entirely different from this but we need to rule out that's the reason we proceed for hearing evaluation also all right so this condition is known as uh, glue ear also known as non suppurative otitis media or secretory otitis media where there is non infective fluid collection in the middle ear so the patients do not experience any ear pain but they complain some ringing sounds or different weird sounds in their ear and also ear block and in this patient even the nasal polyposis uh, caused eustachian tube obstruction and leading to stagnation of fluids in the middle ear so how do we manage this case we usually managed this case uh, in this scenario because it's a long lasting thing we managed this surgically uh, i made an incision in the ear drum we also call this as a meringotomy which is very commonly seen in kids and also done in kids you can see there with the help of a suction i'm sucking away the glue the we ensure that the entire see how thick that glue is we may just think that it's some watery kind of thing but it's a proper glue and we make sure that the entire glue is sucked out and uh, finally so that's a micro suction cannula but in the endoscope it appears uh, such a big one and finally we place a grommet or a vt or ventilating tube in the incision which we made prior in the ear drum thus uh, providing ventilation for the middle ear simultaneously we also perform endoscopic sinus surgery and polypectomy addressing the root cause for the uh, middle ear fluid formation yes someone asked me a question surgery such as adenoidectomy yes if for kids we as i told you when they come with this ear thing we need to check for the nose and throat 
so if the patients have some tonsils and adenoid infection especially adenoid infections we also address that problem but in our situation because she is an adult individual uh, there is a clear cut nasal polyposis so i straight away went ahead and removed the polyps and also addressed the patient's hearing loss by placing a vt a ventilating tube so we can see different types of uh, glue formations in the middle ear and they take different shapes this way they are very emotive and sometimes they even express love all right now coming to differential diagnosis or the probable diagnosis so i'll be displaying once again some images make sure that you answer them this are quite very very easy so what do you think this is i'm just running out of time i guess it is up 15 minutes yes 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 the answer is a cerumen most of you have answered that's a clear cut cerumen wax in the ear okay next one what do you think this is <clears throat> wow also if you know the answer yes that's a uh, tympanous sclerosis there is some patchy deposits or chalky deposits within the eardrum and because it's forming in the eardrum called tympanic membrane and sclerosis so it's a tympanous sclerosis the grommet is the one or the vt or the ventilating tube is the one which i've shown you earlier by placing a meringotomy i've shown you earlier that's the grommet and this is a tympanous sclerosis okay proceeding next what do you think this is so these are the options excellent the answer is uh, osteoma and most of you have given this so there is no explanation needed the name itself indicates osteoma it's uh, a growth abnormal protrusion or growth which is arising from the bony part of the external auditory canal so this is uh, the osteoma so coming to the further differential diagnosis what do you think these little berries are so these are the polyps or the organized uh, granulation tissues okay <clears throat> these patients also complain of uh, ear block like the patients with glue ear so when patients complain of ear block we also need to put an otoscope or place an endoscope and check for all these conditions when they present to us all right so this is really interesting tell me what's happening here no options for you okay the picture of the clarity is really not good i'll play this for you anyhow i hope this plays that's a dancing thing yes that's a bug in the ear it was just taken today so i just kept it there so this is how i dressed it we hold the endoscope with the left hand and with the help of a forceps just stop hold it and remove it some of them they really complain of uh, ringing sounds in the ear but not all the time we should think that the patients have some glue or something we need to clearly check for an insect also and it happens that way and it happened many times for us so <laughs> we have to really have an eye on that also okay proceeding to case 4 uh a 2 year old baby was brought to me with a single sided nasal discharge 
since only one day. It was sudden in onset and the child did not have any history of cold, cough or any kind of upper respiratory tract infection. So do you suspect anything? Usually children can be very mischievous. So would you like to probe patients for uh, patients or the patient attenders like the parents for about anything because the child is just two years old? Because the child is two years old and there is no history of nasal, uh, I mean, cold or cough, there is no history of infection and they are complaining of only one-sided uh, nasal discharge, we usually suspect of a foreign body uh, in the ear or nose. In this scenario, it's in the ear, in the nose. So we, I did a nasal endoscopy under uh, short GA and then I visualized a peanut, which is uh, deep in the nasal cavity. Now, on removing the peanut, I noticed some blood staining also, and also granulations, which are indicated of a foreign body reaction in the nose. And that's a cause for the nasal discharge. And you can also, I also examine the other side to make sure that uh, the child is uh, not hiding anything from us. Similar kind of nasal endoscopy, which is done on a five-year-old child, but because the child is a bit bigger, so they do cooperate for endoscopies in OPD itself. So we spray numbing spray and decongestant spray and uh, diagnostic nasal endoscopy done. In this, in this uh, scenario, uh, the baby pushed a button. So that's a button. But she cooperated very well in the OPD itself or else we would have had to give her some short GA, do something and then proceed. So one has to really look forward into uh, when the people complain, when especially kids complain of unilateral nasal discharge, one-sided nasal discharge. All right, coming to the next case scenario, a 40-year-old female patient presented to us with uh, throat pain and freaking sensation in the throat. She complains of throat pain since one day, which was once again sudden in onset. And the pain started after consumption of fish. What else would you like to know? It's a straightforward thing. We will also like to know what's the exact uh, site of her pain, right? So I did an endoscopy once again in the OPD itself. And uh, when we do it, inside the throat we call this as a video laryngoscopy where we examine the throat and also your voice box and this is the tongue so that's the epiglottis can someone make out the fish bone so now you can see that's the symbol forceps which we use in the opd that little transparent one is the fishbone, which got just stuck at the base of the tongue. So that's how we remove it. But the tricky thing with this fish bones are they're very transparent. So you need to make sure that which side are they having. And because it's in the base of the tongue, they they have a very bad gag, so they start vomiting. So you need to give some numbing spray. But finally, we can easily remove that. All right. So moving on to case five. A 27-year-old uh, female presented to us with complaints of hoarseness of voice. She had hoarseness of voice uh, since six months, which is progressive. Was, and it was progressively worsening. She experienced episodes of complete voice loss also in between. She does not give any history of uh, sore throat or dysphagia. Dysphagia is uh, uh, difficulty in swallowing. Odinophagia. Odinophagia is uh, uh, painful swallowing. And dyspnea is shortness of breath, difficulty in taking breath. So she denies any of this. And she also gives a history of excessive voice usage, being a homemaker and also a mom of four kids. 
and she does not give any history of uh, upper respiratory tract infection or trauma or fever. All right, her uh, ear, nose, throat examination and neck examination were normal and her voice was a bit rough and dry and we investigated the patient further with the help of a flexible nasolaryngoscopy. So before I show you the flexible nasolaryngoscopic picture of this patient, uh, I would like you to see how a normal looking larynx uh, looks like and appreciate its anatomy. So this is how a normal larynx looks like. So this is the epiglottis. Uh, and these are the vocal cords. So you are seeing basically from the top, your voice box you're seeing from the top. And uh, these are the airy epiglottic folds. These are the arytenoids. And these are the entry of the foot pipe the pyriform fossa. All right. Okay. Oh, uh, so this is how the vocal cords move while we speak. You can very clearly see the mucosal wave uh, pattern. And also the frequency at which they vibrate. Okay. Okay, this is the endoscopic picture of our patient and of our patient's vocal cords. What do you think is wrong with them? Oh, some of you have been giving the answers. I think this is for the previous one. Yes, vocal hemorrhage. Yes. Bleeding, vocal cord hemorrhage. Perfect. You have given the diagnosis itself. Yes, most of you are giving the right answers. You can see diffuse uh, blood collection under the surface of a left vocal cord producing a small bump like lesion on the left vocal, cord, vocal fold edge. And this we call as uh, vocal cord hemorrhage because she's a mom of four kids. She starts screaming and there's voice misuse. Uh, so this is a clear cut vocal cord hemorrhage. You can see blood staining, blood collection. And I kept the patient under observation to see uh, if it could uh, spontaneously resolve with medications. Like I kept her on PPIs and some anti-inflammatory meds and also asked her to take strict voice rest. And finally on the 50, 45th post-op I mean, 45th day, we uh, did a repeat endoscopy and I could see that the blood collection, although not completely, but partially resolved and it was properly organized into a small polyp kind of stuff. So because it is filled with blood and it is a polypoidal lesion, we call this as hemorrhagic polyp. And uh, the patient was a bit apprehensive about her voice. So I proceeded with microlaryngoscopic excision of the hemorrhagic polyp. And this is the final endoscopic picture, which is taken 20 days after the surgical procedure. And uh, this is how we do uh, the microlaryngoscopic excision with the help of a laser. And this is a microscopic uh, view of our larynx or the voice box. So we can, you can see that the laser beam, which is pointed over the vocal cord. We precisely laserize the edges as shown. That's how precise millimeter by millimeter we need to go ahead because preservation of voice is really, really very important and the tags whichever are left over are precisely cut and that's almost the final picture after excision okay so there are many other vocal cord lesions which cause similar symptoms so what do you think has happened to these vocal cords it's almost there. I just need five more minutes, not even five, but three more minutes. <laughs> okay, is that okay? Yeah. No, for sure, yeah. 
So what do you think this is? I can get a very straightforward answer. Sister Polyp, yes. This, uh, there's a small bump on one of the vocal cords and uh, especially on the edge and that is cystic inconsistency and we call this as vocal cord cyst. Sometimes even a polyp appears this way but usually the polyps are pedunculated like the previous one and also uh, even the vocal nodules appear the same way but vocal nodules or the singer's nodules or the screamer's nodule usually appear on both the sides of the vocal cords. So because of chronic banging of the vocal cords, but here you can very clearly see that there is early vocal nodule change on one side and there is one cystic formation on the other side. So this is a vocal cord cyst. These cysts are usually fluid filled uh, sacs and the Procedure would be once again microlaryngoscopic excision and removal of the cysts and the patients immediately restore their voice, they get back to normal. So this is vocal cord cyst. And what do you think this is? What do you think has happened here? I'll just play it for you. You can see both the vocal cords are mobile. Okay, this is the picture. Can I get the answers? This is a pretty easy thing. Olip. Yes, yes. A few of you are getting. This is a uh, a cancer. This appears to be a cancer. This is some ulceroproliferative mass on the vocal cord, on the left vocal cord. And there is a suspicion of uh, carcinoma. So we excise the entire mass in total and we send the specimen for histopathological evaluation. In these cases, the earlier the diagnosis can be made, the better the prognosis can be. Okay, so that's it for today. Any questions? Okay, thank you guys so much for having me. And uh, it has been great. And I hope this uh, presentation uh, has been educational and interesting. And thank you, especially Devi Dikshita Nela Kuti for uh, giving me this opportunity. I'm sorry, it took a while, but thank you so much for coming. Um, I think everyone really appreciated everything. Um, and the whole presentation, like I said, I think I've told like all the students, you're really good at like breaking down the cases and like presenting with images, which is really helpful during the pandemic and we can't be in person. Honestly, I felt like I was in person when I first watched your Medvacate event. So thank you so much. Um, and then if you, do you want the recording by any chance? Cause I can send you that in the email. Um, yeah, I'd love to. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Okay. I can send that over. If possible, or else, uh, not. I'm not very specific on that. <laughs> oh, no problem. Yeah, it's just a recording link because it's going to the cloud, so I can. That's okay. Then, then please do share me then. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I can do that, and then yeah, please take note of her contact information if you ever need to talk to her. Um, with that said, if you don't have any questions, uh, we can end the event. Okay, I'll stay behind, but everyone is um, free to go. Can I stop sharing the screen? Yep, yeah, you can stop sharing the screen. Oh. Okay, I believe we have one question. Um, if you have time, Dr. Rao.
I know we're over time. Please go ahead. Yeah, it said, what does the work-life balance look like for an ENT? Uh, see, it depends from country to country. Uh, I feel uh, in India, once again, uh, the good thing about this ENT is, you know, it's quite vast. We deal with uh, ears, we deal with nose, and we deal with throat, we deal with head and neck, and also with the allergies, about the cancers regarding all these. And sometimes when, if you are not interested in proceeding for surgical things, you may just land up with dealing as an allergy specialist or auto neurologist. And, uh, you know, most of the surgical procedure other than carcinomas are elective. So for me, a typical work day, I start from uh, 9 a.m. and I end by 8 a.m. But because I being a private practitioner, I can decide so. But most of my friends who stay in abroad, they say that, you know, they have very specific timings and uh, most of the surgeries are elective. So I feel it's a pretty good branch to go ahead when compared to the branches also, because you deal with uh, both elective and, the and also the emergency. So you can opt for any subspeciality you go and whichever subspeciality, it becomes a super speciality in fact. For example, I opted for cochlear implant where I deal with a, a month old baby and basically you are restoring the senses of an individual. So that happiness and also uh, interaction with the patients, uh, it's really good. So for me, the work-life balance is really good, but I do not know much about you guys who still stay there. And I believe another question was, how did you get into the specialty and like, how did you choose ENT? ENT, as I told you, no, I didn't mention you. My parents are doctors. So my mom, she's uh, into gynops and my father is an anesthetist. So I was fixed that I am supposed to become a doctor, but I didn't want to always go into emergencies like where there is absolutely no family life, like how my mom, all, all the time she used to attend for the emergencies and all my, my papa, my father being an anesthetist, he barely attended an entire movie with me whenever we go to the movie theater. So I made sure that I want to become a surgeon, but something which deals with the elective. And also I would love to have patient interactions because I speak a lot and I want to get connected with them. So uh, that's the reason uh, I was thinking something about ophthalmology or ENT. And once again, when I really went into it, the number of procedures or the number of opportunities we have in ENT are vast or immense. You know, you can go into ear, nose, throat, or uh, any of one of this, even head and neck, and even rhinoplasty, facial plastics also, which is booming nowadays. So that made me uh, undoubtedly go ahead with this uh, ENT. And once again, pursue in this cochlear implant. And right now, if you see, most of my patients are kids and I really enjoy them. I, I even enjoy ear piercing, doing ear piercing for a baby. Yep. And I think the last question we have in the chat box was, um, I guess, like private practice, how is the whole path of, you know, kind of making your own time um, as an ENT? Private practice, once again, is a bit different from that of uh, normal, how you work in the institutes, because in private practice, you work entirely for yourself. It, it, you have some private independence. If you want to work on this day, you can. If you want to, that one, once again, as I told you, I work with my family itself, with my husband and with my father-in-law. So I have that independence. But apart from that, uh, with the private practice, uh, uh, especially into ENT, 
you know you can just stick on to a particular sub speciality and if you want you can just operate all the procedures like you can operate ear nose throat together but in in the institutes where it becomes a tertiary center when you are sub specialized in a particular thing only those will be there but in a private setup you get to operate a normal tonsil normal adenoidectomy and you also get to operate a pituitary adenoma or a lateral skull base so you get to operate all the extents from here to there from uh, from number 1 to number 10 uh so i feel rather than just working in institute private practice is uh, uh much more useful for an ent surgeon because as i told you the specialties are vast especially vast and that too we work in a uh, center like uh, hyderabad being a, once again our hospital being a tertiary center i have the opportunity to uh, as i told you i operate very little little surgeries and also the vast surgeries but i don't feel the same with the the tertiary institutes so i would always prefer going with the uh, private institutes only and you can have the freedom any time whenever you want to withdraw from it you can just withdraw or do I believe that is all so thank you once again and I'll make sure to send the recording but thank you everyone for attending and bye 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 thank you thank you